All right, let's get started. Good morning, good morning, good morning. Let's get started with a word of prayer. Father, Jesus, Holy Spirit, again, we just thank you for the opportunity to come and worship you and honor you, but also hear a word from you uh, in direction and in um, help. We just stand and ask in the name of Jesus that you will help us today, that you will allow your power to come down on this word and preach with great authority and direction to pierce the the most um, wounded hearts, the, the most guarded hearts, the most hard hearts, um, those that are really shut down, Father, that uh, life has been so hard to them that they, they are rejecting uh, everything around them. Uh, they're, they're such a negativity upon them. I pray that today you would absolutely wash them with the blood of the Lamb and that you would take the sword, the Word of God, and pierce their hearts to change them. Cannot do this without you. So in that I invite you, Holy Spirit, have your way. Anoint this word with great power. And again, we just give you all the praise and honor and glory and ask all these things in Jesus Christ's holy name. Amen. All right. So as I was putting this word together, I, you know, I love stories about, you know, the past, things you've been through, things that you've done, you know, especially like, I think, I think a lot of the stories come from my high school years, because I guess that's really when my memory just about them, of being, uh, of, I don't know, just things that happened in my life, um, I, I, and in this, uh, I remember the time that I, I love sports, um, I didn't know anything about until like in my 10th grade about a sport that was called cross country, cross country is a, a race, um, for 3.2 miles, and then that, uh, you just get in there, and you just try to, for, actually, for me, it was, at first, it was like trying just to, let's just finish the race without dying and falling off the side there with big cramps, and, you know, and, and cramps in your stomach, in your gut, you know, and then your legs all cramping up there, was, you know, that, that's what it was at first, but as a, I had a very good coach taught me how to get in, in shape real quickly, and, and in that, um, but one of the things that I found that, went, that helped me in my running was the right pair of shoes. Um, we used the, um, uh, a pair of shoes that were known for tracks. Back in the day, track, um, the track that was for racing around like the 100-yard dash and things like that was made out of cinders. It, was a, it wasn't an asphalt track. It was not like a, the, one of those rubber tracks. It's not like the nice tracks that they have nowadays. But in that, so you had to wear these pair of shoes that were like really thin and light. But in that, you could take a pair, of, um, it had like these screw-on little metal cleats on the front part on the front part of your, of your shoe, not on the back part because that's where most of your pushing off was, was on the front part of your shoes. Now you could adjust these spikes to go from real tiny ones for if you had a really compact track, a really you know, tight and hard track to, to run on that one. And then to, if you went into like long distance running where it was a lot of grass and dirt and things like that, you can adjust the spike to get longer. When cross country came, we knew a lot of times when we, we knew the, the courses that we were going to be on, um, some of the courses I ran, it was in Akron, Ohio is where I'm from, and so in that there was either a college, we would be running on a college campus because they had a lot of open space, or a park. Now I'm remembering that the most specific race was on this Saturday, and it was at Goodyear Metropolitan Park there in Akron, Ohio. There was about five schools that come to this race on a Saturday morning, and then that uh, I remember that there was about maybe about fifty of us lining up. It was the boys would run first, and then the girls would come in and start afterwards. And then that that we we got up there and we all got ready, got our stretching done, and we got the right spike on, you know. And everybody, you know, you know, you know the serious runners when they had the nice shoes. They had the nice you know, screw on cleats uh, that put on there and they knew exactly the length that they needed because this course here at, at, um, at the Goodyear Metropolitan Park had a hill. I mean, it had a big hill to run. So you wanted to have the longer spike 
to help dig in climbing up that hill to come up around. And then as you got around the, the, the path of it, then you would head down the hill that also would help you in your transition going down the hill as well. So in that, we wore the longer spikes on this course. So as we heard that the, 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 the ref go, on your mark, get set, and he had a gun, which was kind of cool, you know, and he would shoot the gun, and that means go take off. And in that, the first probably like eighth of a mile, you come to a turn, and there's a, like a big clump of trees, and then it's like it all narrows down. So we're all lined up on this a line it was somebody spray painted in the grass you know and majority of us there's probably about 25 it's like light on the line and then a few are back and they just kind of staggered in but you knew the the best runners were always in the center right up on the line because as soon as you said go they would take off and then people would just kind of funnel in behind them and then they would go into the first turn and then the the, the path went from wide open fields to a path and then you had to make yourself it would be tighter around the, the 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 woods and then the bunch of trees and then you started on the path and then off you go into the race for 3.2 miles so in the first right off the get-go we're saying on your mark get set go and we're running and all of a sudden the path is you know the pack is getting tighter and it's thinning out you know the fast ones are shooting up in front and then we come in and we're coming to that first bunch of, of trees and as we start to go around her, I'm watching these two guys going like this ba elbowing back and forth at each other and all of a sudden the one he just gets I can just see the irritation on him because he's just he's trying even harder that he lifts his leg up like this as he's running he lifts it up a little bit extra high as he's going around the one the bush over there and he goes like this and he hits the guy that hit him first and he takes his spike and runs it down his leg the guy falls over and automatically I, you know I'm a few guys back behind him so I'm seeing all this happen in front of me I've seen him fall over and all of a sudden I see blood just all of a sudden come right running down his leg he gashed him bad I slowed down and went over to like this to grab him like this but within a second he was back up on his feet and back in the pack. He didn't quit. Even though he was damaged and hurt and, and, and scarred from somebody else. You see, life is like that. We go through things that happen in our lives and people in their anger or, or their loss of understanding of what is happening around them and they, they hurt somebody else, they hurt you. That most of us will sit down and we'll fall down and we'll cry and we'll boo-hoo and we'll wait for somebody to come by and pick us up. If that happens. But some are very strong and they have something inside them as a passion that they get back up and get back in the race. This word today is going to be um, a little bit different. Uh, in, in Galatians chapter 2... Uh, I'm sorry, Galatians chapter 6, verse 7, it says, Be not deceived, God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. Understanding that a lot of times, maybe some of the things that you have happened to you that you have fallen down is because something you, you did. You hurt somebody, I'm telling you, by the fact of what God's word says, there's going to be hurt coming back to you. It's just, a, it's just a done deal. It's just the, the law of God and the attraction of what he has said happens. Gravity, what must go up will come down and it'll come down fast. And it will hit hard. But in today's word, it's going to be a little bit interesting. Yes, it, I, could, I could just absolutely take, let it go in my own flesh and go into my own desires of what I want to preach to you. But God's word wants to say something different. Yes, there is consequences to all actions. What you put out is what you're going to get back. That is, it could be the word for today. But it's not. The end results, if you could just pay attention to the very end, the word will be there for you at the end. But we're going to go on this little journey as we like ran in, in, in cross country. You got to stay on the path. You got to endure to the end. You got to run and keep on running. You cannot stop. Even though somebody knocks you down, you got to get back up and get back in the race and hear the word that God has for you today. 
Today we're going to bring the story from 2 Samuel chapter 12. But to introduce the story, it's going to start off like this. David, he becomes king of Israel. Now, as this point of the story earlier before in 2 Samuel, I believe it is in 11, Daniel, I mean, David is in this point of that he is king and he is doing his thing and everything is working out. Why? Because God is with him. But I think here's what we forget. Sometimes when you're in this place and everything is going good, you forget where you came from. In this moment in time, David decides that he's going to stay home and not do what he's supposed to do. He's supposed to go to war with his people to, that are battling the Philistines. He's supposed to go out there and encourage and give directions how to bring victory for the people against the enemies of God and against the enemies of Israel. But he decides to stay home. And as he stays home, he finds himself one day on the balcony knowing because he's seen it before, knowing that there's going to be something out there that he likes to see. A beautiful woman comes up on, onto the roof of, of her house to take a bath at night. And he stands there and he watches. And then this time it gets to him and he makes the move. He tells his servant, go get that woman and bring her to me. You can't tell the king no, because he's, you know, that woman, I know that woman. That woman is married and he's at battle and you're up here and you're going to want her to come to you. You can't do that, king. No, you cannot say that to the king because he is king and he has power. It's like being, I see this quite a few often. It's like being at work and you got to address the boss and the boss is telling you to do something and you're telling the boss, that's not a good idea. That, that's probably going to end up backfiring and, and, and we're going to have to pay for it. And the boss is going to look at you and say, either do what I say or there's the door and leave. David gets her. He lays with her, and she gets pregnant. Now he's like in a pickle because the word comes back to, her, to him like, uh, yo, yo, man, uh, you remember that girl on the rooftop? Yeah, yeah, she come back, she's pregnant. The rabbit died. <laughs> what you gonna do now, king? Uh, I'll figure something out. And so he tries to make a trick happen. You know how sometimes when you do something wrong, you're always going to try to trick and make it go right your way, and it, and it ends up backfiring? You know, back when you're at work and you're trying to do something and, you know, trying to make it work out, that you, you know you messed up, but you're trying to make it look good that, you know, so the boss won't catch it. Or maybe when you're at home and, you know, and you're telling mom and dad, you know, it's like a, you get busted for doing something you, you knew you weren't supposed to do, but you finagle some kind of excuse or lie to cover it up. And it just always backfires. And David does the same thing. He gets the guy to come home and tries to make up an excuse for him to be with his wife. And you know that way the pregnancy looks like it's his. And it doesn't work because he says my guys are out there fighting the good fight. And I want to be out there with them. I cannot do this with my wife while they're being, they're being killed out there. And so end up, David makes the decision and says, here, and he hands the note to him, and the note says, put him at the front of the battle, and then back away. And so it was like a suicide mission. And David has him killed. And this is where we pick up the story. I like to read it through, because I really just feel when... I don't know, I just, it just seems to show better that God shows up, Holy Spirit shows up to reveal what needs to be said as we read His Word. 2 Samuel chapter 12, verse 1. It says, The Lord sent Nathan to David. Now Nathan is the priest at the time that David is in rule. When he came to David and he said, There were two men in the city. One was rich, but the other was poor. The rich man had many sheep and cattle, but the poor man had nothing except one little female lamb he had bought. 
The poor man fed the lamb and it grew up with him and his children. It shared his food and drink and drank the cup, drank from the cup and slept in his arms. The lamb was like a daughter to him. Then the traveler stopped, then a traveler stopped to visit the rich man. The rich man wanted to feed the traveler, but he didn't want to take one of his own sheep of the cattle instead or cattle instead he took the lamb from the poor man and cooked it for his visitor David became very angry at the rich man he said to Nathan as surely as the Lord lives the man who did this should die he must pay for the lamb four times for doing such a thing he had no mercy Nathan Then Nathan said to David, you are the man. This is what the Lord, the God of Israel says. I appointed you king of of Israel and saved saved you from Saul. I gave you his kingdom and his wives. And I made you king of Israel, Judah. And if that had not been enough, I would have given you even more. Listen to those words. This is where I think a lot of us miss it. You have been given a lot, and if you wanted more, you could have asked for more. Instead, you're going out and doing things wrong to suit and feel that to 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 uh, uh, have that selfish desire met. I gave you this kingdom and his wives, and I made you king of Israel and Judah. And if you had not been, if it had not been enough, I would have given you even more. So why did you ignore the Lord's commands? Why did you do what you say is wrong? You killed Uriah the Hittite with the sword of the Am- Am- Ammonites and took his wife to be your wife. I got to read on. Verse 10. Now, there will, there will also be people in your family who will die by the sword. Because you did not respect me, you took the wife of Uriah the Hittite for yourself. This is what the Lord says. I am bringing trouble to, to you from your family. I'm bringing trouble to you from your own family. While you watch... I will take your wives from you and give them to someone who is very close to you. He will have sexual relationship with your wives and everyone will know it. You had sexual relationships with Bathsheba in in secret, but I will do this thing so that so all the people of Israel can see it. Then David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. Now we could stop right here and we could preach this one. This would be like a, 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 an amazing sermon, but it's, it's actually it is for another time. But I'm not going to miss out on the point of saying that what you think, sometimes you think you are better than what you are. Sometimes you think you are all that and a bag of chips. You are it. Your poop doesn't smell. Let's just say that. You get this pride in you or something that's in you and you think you're better than everyone around you. And then you make choices. But here's the thing. All your choices have consequences. All of them. Good or bad. And in this one, for David, here's where the problem is. The consequences doesn't really actually stop with him. They all go to his family. Listen to what the word is saying. It's saying that all of his, his family will be cursed, that they will die by the sword. 
Then, for himself, he's going to be embarrassed in from the, all the land. How would you like to be stood before all your peers at work or at school? And then all your dirty laundry told to everyone while you stood there. How shameful and embarrassing that would be, wouldn't it? And this is pretty much what is going to happen with David. That as he was in secret having an affair with this woman, hiding in the room at night, that all his other wives that he has, somebody else is going to get them and everybody in the kingdom is going to know about it. Do you ever think about the end results if you, before you make the decisions that you make? Let's read on. Then Nathan answered, The Lord has taken away your sins. You will not die. So this is kind of cool. Wow. God has heard David saying, God, forgive me. Now this is kind of crazy. In, in other scripture, God looks at David as he's the apple of my eye. But even as the, that he is God's favorite, he is the apple of his eyes, God does not stop punishment coming from him. <coughs> Think about that. If David is God's favorite, and God still does not stop punishment coming from him, what do you think is going to happen to us? But we got Jesus. We got the blood. We got the sin is sin. And God is the same yesterday, today, and forever, right? Do you want to really take that chance and make that choice to sin against the holy God? To break any of the commandments? Do you really want the consequences? Let's read on. Verse 14. It says, but what? So, 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 let me read it again. Nathan answered, and the Lord take, uh, has taken away your sins. You will not die. But, 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 but what you did caused the Lord's enemy to lose all respect for him. Oh, Wow. Do you understand that if you carry the name of Jesus and you call yourself a Christian and you do something to cause somebody else to sin, now you're just absolutely causing that, that, that this, this scripture right here stands out so hard. That you're causing others to lose respect in God and in Jesus Christ. Wow. That'll preach. And for this reason, let me read on. And for this reason, the son who has born to you will die. He's not going to die. The punishment is now going on to his son. His son's going to die. Because of his disobedience and committing adultery. Jesus says in the scriptures, he says, you know, if you look at a woman with lust or you look at a man with lust, you commit adultery with them in your heart. That's the intensity of Jesus coming and dying on the cross for our sins. It's not just the actions of getting naked with somebody. It's the actions of looking at them and saying, "Ooh, be nice to be with them. You know, the intensity of the heart. You think you hate a man, you commit murder. The intensity of God's word is great. You see, where there is no blood, there is the need of a payment for the wages of sin that is done. God took the son of David for his, because of his sin. That will mess somebody up. 
If we was able to get before God and ask the hard question, God, why did this person die? Would the answer be because of sin in somebody's life or their life? And they're not repenting and turning away from their sins and hardening their heart caused one of two things. The hand of God's mercy step away and the curse of the world of death come upon them or God himself saying, I've had enough of this, this is the punishment. Those are deep thoughts. Something deep to really think about. Your soul does not stop and just, it doesn't just quit existing when this body is put in the ground. When the, the heart stops beating and you stop breathing, you go somewhere. Heaven or hell. Let's read on. Verse 15. Then Nathan went home, and the Lord caused the son of David and Bathsheba, Uriah's widow, to be very sick. David prayed to God for the baby. David fasted and went into the house and stayed there, lying on the ground all night. The elders of, the elders of David's family came to him and, and tried to pull him up from the ground, but he refused to get up or to eat food with them. On the seventh day, the baby died. David's servants were afraid to tell him that the baby was dead. They said, look, we tried to talk to, to David while the baby was alive, but he refused to listen to us. If we, <coughs> if we tell him the baby is dead, he may do something awful. When David saw his servants whispering, he knew that the baby was dead. So he asked them, is the baby dead? They answered, yes, he is dead. Let's stop there for a second. I understand part of this. More so, my brother would understand this. My brother had a two-year-old who died in a drowning accident. I, 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 I sit back, and I, when, when it all that was going down, I couldn't comprehend one of my children dying before I would die. I don't know the pain my brother went through or his wife went through to see one of their children die. I don't know that pain. And I'm glad. I don't know the effects of my thinking or my heart or my willingness of what would happen if one of my children would pass before me. I don't know and I don't want to know. But I watched my brother. And I watched how he just went closer and closer to God and to Jesus and prayed and read his word. He shut down for a while, but he stayed in the word and he read it and he prayed and he sought God. But he, his words, it was a dark time. It was bad. And I know that part. Losing a spouse. I know that word. That is darkness. That is hard. How do you behave when you get to that point in life? Do you run from God and do you curse Him and do you say He doesn't exist? What is your actions upon that? Those are times that you get knocked down and you're just saying, there's no way I'm going to be able to get up from this. There's no way I'm going to survive from this. There is no way that this is going to matter. This is, this is just going to end my life. I might as well die myself. Those are the things that go through your thoughts. Those are the things that intensely attacks your heart. Many of you have been through this. Many of you have had that darkness of death come to you. Some of you have lost your mom and your dad and you were like close. You were like best friends, you know, as an adult. And now you feel so lost because they're not there for you to call them every day. 
Some of you have lost a spouse. Some of you have lost children. And I'm sorry. But we forget this is a fallen world full of death, curses, but it's not the end. God is still God and He is still good and He's still on the throne. He is a just God, but He's also a merciful God and a loving God. But the integrity of who you are is how long you will stay laying down in that spot and say, woe is me. The intentions that you are still alive is that means you still have purpose. God has something for you to do. For David, he had a kingdom to run. He needed to still point his people that he was over back to God. Even though he's the one that screwed up and his life could have took every one of It could have took millions of souls straight down the wrong path and led them away from God. It could have happened that way. But he saw he sinned against the holy God and he repented of it and he recognized he sinned. Today is the day that I bring to you an understanding that do you recognize your sin against the holy God? And do you say, I have sinned against this God. I have lusted. I have lied. I have stolen. I have cheated. I have rebelled as, as rebellion is considered witchcraft. I have created witchcraft in my family and in my house because of the rebellion. I have sinned against the holy God and I want to repent of it and change my direction. And I'm coming before God, Jesus Christ, and ask for forgiveness of my sins. Let's see what David does. Let's see what a character of a man who is after God does. Verse 20. It says, and David, Then David got up from the floor, washed himself, put lotion on, and changed his clothes. Then he went into the Lord's house to worship. What did he do? Took a shower, washed himself up, put some nice clothes on, and he went to God's house and worshiped God. After that, he went home, asked for some, something to eat. His servants gave him some food, and he ate. Verse 21. David's servant said to him, why are you doing this? When the baby was still alive, you fasted and cried. Now that the baby is dead, you, you get up and you eat food. David said, while the baby was still alive, I fasted and I cried. I thought, who knows, maybe the Lord will feel sorrow for, for me and let the baby live. But now that the baby is dead, why should I fast? I cannot bring him back to life. Someday, I will go to him. But he cannot come back to me. Wow. His view of life is true. The past has happened, and there's no changing it. The past has happened. I cannot go back and bring this baby. I have no power to bring this baby back to life. So what am I to do? I'm to move forward. I am to get on with my life because I cannot do nothing about this. Laying here and wallowing around and fasting even more will not change the circumstances that it's already done. You are where you are because of whatever happened in your past. But you cannot change that. What you can change is now and then the future. 
And that has to do with your relationship with Jesus Christ. Knowing God is still God. God knows the bad that is happening. He knows the good that is happening. He is all knowing. But in your, in your, in your pursuit of getting through your life, that journey, that, that long distance run, because if the Lord wills and you make it to 75, 76, 80, 93 years old, <coughs> excuse me, that is a long life. And it's hard sometimes to get up day. I, I just already hear my teenagers Monday morning. Here's time to get up and get over to school. Oh, the weekend's over already. I've got to get up and go to school. Woe is me. We need to know life can either end in a moment or by God's grace, we can live a long time. But what are you going to do with that time? It's almost like when you go to the graveyard and you see the day that they were born and the day that they, were be- uh, that they died and there's this dash in the middle. What did you do with your life in that dash? Was it about your relationship with Jesus Or was it about your selfishness? Or was it about the past and what people did to you? What is the dash in your life? In Luke chapter 9, verse 60, it says this. But Jesus said to him, let the people who are dead bury their own dead. You must go and tell about the kingdom of God. What God is saying today, it's time to get up and move forward. It's time to let go of what's happened to you in the past. It's time to quit being bitter and angry at those people who did you wrong and you suffered the consequences of it. It's time for you to get up. It's like that kid as I saw him get that, that, that shoe was run down there, that spike ran down on down on his leg and it gashed him and blood was just coming down his leg. He didn't lay there and say, oh, I'm cut, somebody come and help me. No, that boy got up and got back in the race. What did David do? He went and cleaned himself up and he got back on his throne and he, and he did what a king is supposed to do over the land you have purpose and it's time for you to let go of what's happened to you in the past it's done forgive them that did you the wrong let it go and say okay God where are we going we're moving forward I want to move forward with you it's time it's time to get up It's time to move forward. It's his word of encouragement for you today. Why? Because this is the time of the harvest. And there's people all around you ready to meet Jesus. And you, you are the one that's going to show them Jesus. That's why you are here where you are right now. You're hearing this word for this appointed time to encourage you. Let that go. It's time to look forward because when you read the prophecies of what's yet to come before Jesus and comes and gets his people and 2 Thessalonians of the, of, of, of the catching up and before Jesus comes back to the, the, the battle of Armageddon, there's going to be a lot of people that die. Good and bad. Christian and non-Christian. How much more will you like to stand before your God and your Jesus and say, I told them about you every time. When you brought new people in, I showed them Jesus. 
not just by telling them, but by how I lived. I live for you. I honored the commandments. I, I did not lie. I honored my father and mother. I did not gossip. I did not steal. And I did not create other gods before you. You've made it to this point. It's time to get up. It's time to wash up, put some nice clothes on, and it's time to move forward. Maybe today, your issue is that you've just never been born again. You've never been saved. You've been in church all your life. You went to church with your grandma and your mom. Or, you know, somebody brought you to church, but you never asked Jesus to save you. Today is the day of salvation. Today is the day you repent of your sins and say, I want to be saved. I want to be born again. I want to be baptized with the Holy Spirit. I want to follow Jesus. I want to encourage you to pray and ask for that. Maybe today you're a follower of Jesus and you're just like, it's like bad things after bad things keep happening to, to you. And maybe it's because you are far, you've, you've left God. You've left your first love. You've left Jesus. And it's time to repent of that. It's time to clean up, let go of the past. It's time to move forward. Will you do that as we pray? If you bow your heads, Father, Jesus, Holy Spirit, again, we just thank you for the opportunity to preach your word. We pray that you again anoint this word with great power to stir our hearts and our minds and our thinking of where we, at, we, where we are at. Are we laying on the side of the road, hurt from what's happened to us? Are we holding bitterness and anger against somebody that's harmed us or did us wrong? Or are we suffering from even our own choices and our own sins that we have, 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 have done against you or somebody else or against ourselves? God, I pray right now you'll bring conviction to everyone that is needing it. For the lost that need salvation, help them pray, Holy Spirit, to repent and ask to be born again. That you will baptize them with your spirit. God, and today, as the believers of Christ, will you get us ready to be used for this harvest that is here? God, we need help to share Jesus. We need help. We need boldness to share Jesus. We need help. We need eyes to see the lost that are before us. Give us a picture of our friends dying and burning in hell that will change our hearts and our minds to say, I don't want that for them. I'm going to tell them of the love that Jesus has for them. Equip your people, Father. Equip them with everything they need to be the light where they are. That the lost may be found and be saved. Father, Jesus, Holy Spirit, we love you. And we stand on the words of Isaiah on this. That this word will go forth and it will accomplish the things we're into a descent. I pray your blessing upon your people. That your will will be done. That they will recognize your kingdom is come near to them today. In Jesus Christ's holy name we pray and ask all these things. Amen. You are dismissed.